the excitement, the challenge, the sheer chaos of India. 1.3 billion people and rising. That and much more coming up next on Mission 360. Welcome to Mission 360, I'm Gary Krauss. I'm in the heart of Bombay and right behind me here is the house of Mahatma Gandhi where he lived from 1917 to 1934. It was from this house that Gandhi had the vision for a movement of freedom for the country of India. And he launched the Satyagraha movement and he abided by his principles of non-violence, totally non-violent, uh, protest against the British government and he launched a movement that led to the freedom of India, the independence of India, and he did it not with guns, not with power, not through violence. Gandhi never became a Christian, but he admired Jesus Christ, and he in particular turned to the Sermon on the Mount as principles that he could live by. On today's Mission 360, we'll take you to various parts of the world, but first up, we'll travel to the island of Guam. My name is Lydia Fletcher Scholing. That's L-Y-D-I-A. Middle name Fletcher, F-L-E-T-C-H-E-R. Let's start at the beginning. My story begins about 10 years ago with a song called, Can You Reach My Friend? Can you hear me okay? Yes. My sister-in-law invited me to listen to a new radio station on island and um, we stayed up all night waiting for the song to play. Off the day, thanks for joining us here on Joy FM this morning. It's good to have you along with us today. Uh, we've got some good news from God's Word coming up in a few minutes, so stay with us. As Lydia listened to the radio, her song came on, then the next program began, and the next. She remained glued to her radio. In the following weeks, Lydia repeatedly tuned to Joy FM Adventist Station. What she heard filled her heart with encouragement and hope. Through Joy FM, Lydia began receiving Bible study guides. The new truth she was learning made an impact in her life and the life of her family. Soon, she was baptized in the Adventist Church, along with her husband and two of her children. Then, something amazing happened. Behind me you see a board with names on it. Our study started just one-on-one -on -one with myself and Charlene, the one in red. She was my daughter's classmate and was really searching for truth. So I said, hey, so why don't we just get together and study and we, maybe we can answer some of the questions that you have. Well, the one-on-one -on -one group grew to six, six attendees and the six of us studied Steps to Christ. For 13 beautiful weeks, we went through chapter by chapter, and God moved in our lives, and there was a closeness to Christ that we had never shared or never knew before. As Lydia's group realized the power of transformation that came from studying about Jesus, they were impressed to begin another study with even more women, and they started making plans. I thought I knew what study I wanted to give. In fact, I was sure of it. I had counseled God. I had advised Him. I had told Him exactly what direction we needed to go. But the Holy Spirit kept nudging Lydia's heart towards a different study. Lydia resisted the suggestion and put it out of mind. It wasn't until 30 minutes before the meeting that she finally threw her hands up in the air and said, Okay, Lord, if I do this for you, you better fill every seat in this room. So she went downstairs to the Adventist bookstore and purchased the study she was impressed to do. 15 minutes after start time, there were only three women in the room. Lydia thought that God was teaching her a lesson to be more reverent in her request to him. It's then that something happened. Five minutes later, 
the door downstairs opens. You can hear a rush of women filling the hallway, talking and chatting to each other, walking up the stairs. And after we gave our hugs and we greeted each other, we all sat down. So I was excited to see if God had really filled the room with and every chair. Lydia learned her lesson. In his time, she just needed to commit to his will. And every chair in the room was filled. Since then, 34 women have studied the Bible with Lydia, sometimes squeezing in tight to hear God's word. And on my last study before I left, I asked each one of them to come up and write a name on the board for a woman that they'd like to pray for. And that's what we have behind me now. As Lydia and the women look ahead to ministering and teaching in the island of Guam, please pray for women around the world who are hungering to hear and learn about Jesus. I'm in the center of Bombay, uh, right behind the Seventh-day Adventist English Church here. And my guest is Mrs. Shree. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Now, you're a, you're a church member here in Bombay. How, for how long have you lived here? I lived in Bombay for the last 25 years, but I'm attending this church almost uh, 22 years. Wow. So you've seen a lot of changes here over the years as the community has grown around it. Yes, the, the church is bordering with the slums, and the slum has uh, increased over the years. Yeah. Now, you were telling me before that you have not always been a Seventh-day Adventist. In fact, you came from a non-Christian background. How, how did you become, become an Adventist? I come from a non-Christian background. I came to Bombay actually to do my PhD, my research. And uh, there I met with uh, some Christian friends. Yes. And we used to have lots of discussion. Basically, I come, uh, I was a Marxist. So the leftist ideology was leading me. And uh, after uh, coming to Mumbai and uh, having discussions, I was uh, influenced by the principles of Bible. Yes. So I came here and I had a Bible study with Pastor Maman for uh, three years or so. After that, I have taken my baptism. Okay. Well, and what difference did it make to your life becoming an Adventist? Becoming an Adventist, uh, I found there's more peace. Yes. And uh, it, it is the personal relationship with uh, God that makes the, uh, the difference. Yeah, I'm sure. Now, we, we've stepped out from behind the church and we're like in a different world here. The, now, you were mentioning this is a poorer area? Yes, this is poor people stay here. They are migrants normally. Okay. So, so these are people who have come in from rural areas. They've come here because they think there'll be more opportunities, more work. Yeah, this is the place where they can come and uh, have their livelihood. Yeah. Now, I, we, we have the church here looking out over this community. And uh, this, is, this is really a, a, a different world to what you have in every Sabbath morning when you're worshiping. Yes. How, how can you even begin to connect with this sort of community? You, you were telling me that you're involved in, in various types of health ministry. Can you describe the sort of things that you've been doing? Yeah, the people in the slums also will have the health problems. So the health men, we cannot go and preach them actually, but uh, we can bring the health programs to them and uh, that way we will be able to interact. That, in that way we will be able to get into uh, friendship and then we will be able to interact with them. Okay, so, so what type of health outreach can you do? <laughs> Teaching, teaching them about uh, teaching them about the good health habits that uh, uh, we can actually talk to them about the prevent, about preventing the substance abuse and the alcohol abuse and also about the need for uh, keeping the environments clean and uh, 
hygiene. Uh, hygiene. Now I understand that Mumbai is like the capital of diabetes in India. A lot of, lot of problems with diabetes. Yes, I, actually Mumbai is also passing through the transition. Yes. And the middle class is becoming more richer, and the middle class uh, feels that uh, they have to uh, it, or they feel it is a status symbol to follow the rich and they like to ape the waste best. So what happens is that uh, they are into the fast foods and uh, uh, they have really changed the eating habits. Uh, so more and more children are uh, eating the fast food and the cold drinks. Right. And uh, essentially that uh, life, lifestyle also has changed where people used to go out and uh, play. Now what they do is once they come back from the school, they will be either busy with the phone or also maybe with the internet and uh, other things where they are physically not involved, actually not involved. So this way they are having less exercise yes. and more of uh, rich food and also more of unhealthy food. Yes. So that is going to create a real trouble. And uh, as it is truly said, we can see the difference in the children. Yes. Because we find more and more uh, children who are obese in the school settings. And as part of our international youth development study also, last year we have added the uh, uh, non-communicable diseases section. So we have weighed their, uh, we have taken their measurements, weight and the height, and also we have asked them about any uh, sicknesses which they have. But we are still in the process of analysis, but even without an analysis, yes. it's uh, almost clear from a sim lay person's point of view that the things are changing. Yeah. You see these little precious kids and you wonder what their future is, don't you? You wonder what sort of, what, what life is going to deal out to them, what sort of opportunities they're going to get and what, what a tremendous challenge it is for the church to not just stay within the four walls of the church but find ways to connect to the community. Yes, the church can do a wonderful work, especially we feel that education can take them or upgrade their life or uplift them. And that way, I think the church has a very big role to play and also bringing them the health aspects or the health knowledge. Yes. It can uh, integrate both the physical health yes. and also that uh, they can, uh, in the process, they will be able to get to know about the Savior. Wonderful. So we will be able to reach them. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing with us today on this very busy street and we'll be right back straight after this break. Welcome back. Next up we travel to Bergen, Norway where Rick Kajira is talking to Klaus Naibo, the president of Lifestyle TV. Thank you, Gary. I'm here in Norway right now, and I'm talking with Klaus Naibo, who's the president of Lifestyle TV, which is based in Sweden, but you cover all of Scandinavia with your That's broadcast. Right. What exactly is Lifestyle TV? Lifestyle TV is a satellite and internet broadcasting where we cover, as you say, all of Scandinavia, so Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. And we broadcast 24 hours a day and have done that now for nine years. And it's, it's amazing to see, really, the results we get. Because you may know, this is a very secular area of Europe where you right. have few people attending church. People talk about somewhere down towards even 2% of the population attending church. So it's a very secular area to reach and create its own challenges. Um, which is, I think, why we're choosing the word also lifestyle TV, trying to reach from a lifestyle approach and a strong health approach into a secular area of the world. Okay, and you must be having people respond to what you're broadcasting. Can you share some of the stories of what impact you're having on people's lives? We do get response. We have people that write us in, and we have a lot of anonymous viewers that just simply watch and watch and enjoy it, and then all of a sudden they will contact us. And I mean, we have people that will contact, like almost out of the blue, come to a church and say, we want to get baptized. We've gotten to learn 
to know about Jesus and we want to accept him as our personal savior and those are exciting people I'm thinking this summer we had one that was actually in Finland and a viewer that had been watching for several years on Lifestyle TV and then got contact with a local Bible worker uh, it was in the Vasa area and it's really unique because in that very area we have the church has like a center of, of hope a restaurant that is working as a, as a mission station to reach people to share people with people about healthy lifestyles and one of their Bible workers got contact with this viewer of ours that have been watching and she requested baptism as a result of this wanting to give her full life to Christ and and to see these connection with a local ministry and the work they do and how they can take a contact and follow up on a, on a personal level and make those connections and then sit down with the last questions you know and help explain the Bible and lead them to the uh, to the point where they're ready to give their life fully to Christ. Now we're here in Bergen because we're looking at maybe a, a, a center of hope here, but the one that's there, can you tell us what they're doing? This is a newer center there in Vasa, Finland. It's an area of Finland that is partly Swedish speaking and partly Finnish speaking. Mm -hmm. And so they have set up a restaurant in a shopping center where they are serving total vegetarian food six days a week uh, for about four hours as a lunch buffet and so they have coming in there a little over a hundred people every day that eat then in the often in the evenings they will have different kind of seminars where they invite people to come in they'll have health lectures or social lectures or different things that connect with lifestyle and so they try to give people more than just good food but also things that can really help them in their life to go home and make changes and start improving their lifestyle. And so from these things, you have people that are asking, of course, you know, what is the background? Why do you do this? Right. And then they get into the whole discussion about their spiritual background from the church. We know that they often use Lifestyle TV as a reference point, And so mm -hmm. working with that and can refer their customers to watch TV which is a great way because a lot of people have spiritual interest. Sure. Uh -huh. But living in, a, in an area where it's more like taboo to talk about it, mm -hmm. you watch at home. And right. so when you sit in the comfort of your living room and the privacy of your four walls, then people engage. They would watch an internet, they would watch a satellite, and then they will look and they will find something that starts changing their life. And then they may come back and start asking more spiritual questions. And that's where these centers are so important that can make those connections with people because these are souls that are searching to to find spiritual meaning in their life and so to have people like that is is gold worth i guess everybody in their life has questions mm. about the greater meanings of life now when you talk about vegetarian restaurants why vegetarian i think especially here in scandinavia it's it's in the time you know people are very health conscious they are environmentally conscious and so realizing that this is a great choice for even the environment uh, to go on a vegetarian diet or a total vegetarian those are things people are interested in and especially that one is, is one that really connects animal rights are strong so how do you treat animals and in that way also going vegetarian that resonates with a lot of people over here so there's a strong movement especially by young people to move towards that and so I think a restaurant like that is very much in and in this case, the name of the restaurant is Vegana. And so already the name is strongly indicating that here's a restaurant that focuses on total vegetarian diet. And that's something that connects and resonates with especially young people. Now, you've eaten at the restaurant, I assume. And when people come in there, you know, what are they expecting and, and how do they think the food tastes? I mean, just sitting and observing, I've been there twice and I, I love just sitting there quiet at a table with my food and just observing customers come in. You see that they're enjoying it, they're thrilled with the food, they bring their friends, they sit and chat at the tables and you can see in their smiles, their laughter, that this is a place they like coming. This is like a little sanctuary for them, you know, a little breathing hole where they come. And so these are the kind of people they work with and it's a, it's a wonderful atmosphere. The food is great. Uh, they have had different kind of cooks there, uh, but the one that is the project leader, Hulda Carlson, is doing a, a phenomenal job in really leading. She's a young girl, 
but she had a vision and she didn't let people deter her because when she first started sharing it you know people was like no the restaurant is a big work you can't do it but she was like well if God wants me to do it and so by faith and a lot of prayer she and her husband Jonathan ventured out and got people excited around them step by step and then they moved out and what God has done is amazing. Well, it sounds like a wonderful partnership. Lifestyle mm. TV that is reaching out into the homes in the, a broad way and a center of hope that is in a local community so people can connect Amen. and enjoy a healthier lifestyle and also get to know some people who can help them maybe learn about Jesus. Exactly. And I think that's the synergy we want to try and see between our media outlets and local churches, centers of hope, different connections between people if we can learn to work together we have so much we can share with people about a new lifestyle that's going to help change their lives klaus thank you so much for talking with us today and now back to you gary well we continue our 360 degree view of mission around the world with two former missionaries to africa dr arthur bergman and dorothy brenwald reminisce about starting a mission hospital in Koza, cameroon a hospital that has brought hope and healing to thousands of people through the years. In 1950, Seventh-day Adventist church members came together to support medical missionary work. Through the 13th Sabbath offering, members like you gave to help send doctors and nurses to the village of Koza in Cameroon. Soon after, a hospital was built to serve the people. Meet Dorothy Brenwald and her brother-in-law, Dr. Arthur Bergman. In the early years, they and their spouses worked at Koza Hospital. These were many people in the Mandurah Mountains who had absolutely no means of medical help. It was very sad. We saw things here that we never studied at all in, in school. Before we were there, they were they were crying for three nights, just almost constantly, because somebody was always dying. And that's one thing the hospital did. I think that's one of our frustrations, was that they wouldn't come at first. They were afraid of us. And uh, they wait until they get deathly sick before they come. They were quite overwhelmed with COSA because it's a, it was so, fresh, so new, and they, they were amazed. Yeah, they're bringing a patient in. Mm -hmm. He came with his car. Sometimes they came in trucks. Yeah. They bring their entire family. They bring somebody to cook food for them in case they need to stay. They'd stay right there with them. They would, they would feed them, they would help them. They never, they never left them, they usually stayed. Koza Hospital quickly grew to an eight-room dispensary with operating room, obstetrical unit, and pharmacy. As hospital expansion took place, the reach of invaluable medical service also crossed borders. Sometimes Fred and I would go on our bicycles to an an area a mile away or something, we'd hold a bush clinic. Well, we're gonna get there pretty soon. It's not very many good roads. <laughs> Wasn't it once a week? I think so. We couldn't take a lot of medication along, but we took the things we thought we would need most and encourage them to come to the hospital if they needed more care. As Dorothy and Arthur spent their days serving the people of Koza, they had fun learning a new culture and observing the different customs of the local people. That's how they dressed. And the men wore a smile, remember? <laughs> they were very gentle people. I, I liked that about them. That's the kind of hut that we lived in, except we had three, three together. That's now, some of the walls beautiful. were stone and others just mud. Most of them were mud, I think. When we went there, we went there for life as we, until Jesus would come. Since those early years, 
many other Adventist missionaries have taken up the challenge to support COZA and other hospitals around the world. Through medical mission, people have been blessed here and now and for eternity. And when we went back in 1985, and that was 25 years after we had been there, we went back for four months. There were tens of thousands of many more people who had been baptized, and that just thrilled me. Your prayerful support and mission offering continue to assist thousands with health, truth, and hope. Well, thanks for joining us today on Mission 360. And I hope that you've been inspired and challenged by what you've seen and heard. And thank you so much for your continuing prayerful support of mission around the world. And thank you also for your financial support. It does make a difference. Before we go, we'd like to send you a special offer as just a small thank you for your continuing support of Adventist Mission. It's a book, a book called God's Great Missionaries. And in here, you'll find lots of different stories of mission around the world, and you'll also read chapters focused on Bible characters and how they were involved in mission and are an example for us today. Well, thanks so much for joining us and I hope you can join me next time right here on Mission 360.